Uh, welcome everyone to the Mechanical Engineering Departmental Information Session. We're excited to have you all uh, joining us for our webinar this evening. My name is Miranda Miller. I'm the Undergraduate Program Manager in Mechanical Engineering. I'll give you a brief rundown of our oops, uh, agenda for the next hour or so. Uh, so our Director of Undergraduate Studies will provide a brief overview of mechanical engineering. And then we have a couple of our professors um, who will talk a little bit about their research, um, just to give you an idea of some of the research that is happening in our department currently. And then lastly, we have uh, four student panelists uh, who are all current students, and so they'll be able to talk a little bit about their experience as an ME student. So without further ado, I will kick it over to Professor Northrup, our Director of Undergraduate Studies. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Miranda. Um, yeah, today I'm going to give you guys a bit of a rundown of a mechanical engineering program and hopefully interest you in, in uh, what we're doing in ME and uh, want you know get you to learn a little bit more about our program and hopefully join us. So uh, yeah, I'm going to give an overview of ME, all the interesting things that we're doing and what it means to be a mechanical engineer. Um, and then I hope that the, that the faculty um, presentations on their research and the student panel will be really informative for you guys as well. So um, yeah, so first, first off, um, I just want to give a broad overview of mechanical engineering as a discipline. So overall, mechanical engineering is probably the broadest engineering discipline. Um, it incorporates things from biomedical to things in fluid flow, heat transfer, controls, robotics, um, and really expands a huge range of competencies. And, um, and that's reflected in the department. Um, the faculty that we have are have wide breadth of experience and um, in training. So we really, uh, you know, to be a mechanical engineer does not constrain you really much at all. Um, you can go on to do all sorts of things, even including medical school, um, law school, other things like that after an ME degree. So really, ME's design, analyze, develop, build anything that moves, right? So we're, we're um, focused on things that are dynamic. Uh, civil engineers do a lot of things that are stationary. We are focused on um, uh, areas ranging from um, machine components to fluid flow in the human body, as I say here. Um, every, uh, I'll give you a kind of an overview of what it means and what we're doing in the department um, in mechanical engineering. So some, some stats here, um, we have about 475 enrolled undergraduates in our program. Um, we have a over 98% placement, job placement rate, and um, students, as I said, find jobs in all sorts of um, engineering sectors and, and beyond. Um, the mean starting salary for our graduates is on the order of $67,000 a year. And if you look at, you know, current literature, ASME and others, um, American Society of Mechanical Engineers and others publish statistics on mean salaries for mechanical engineers in practice. Um, and, you know, the, the 93,000 figure is what I found um, for a mean uh, ME salary uh, out in industry. So um, it's a high, highly, you know, um, interdisciplinary, you can be uh, focused on design or, or other, other aspects of mechanical engineering, which I'll give you some, some overview on. Um, if you've been on campus, obviously, you've seen our um, uh, building, which you can see on the right there, uh, and you see the, the, well, the platonic figure, otherwise known as the Tin Man, um, which was commissioned in 2011, uh, 2001, sorry, when we did a part of the mechanical engineering building. So next slide, please. All right, so the top 11 employers of, of our graduates from the mechanical engineering program include um, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, and St. Jude Medical. You notice that those are very similar companies uh, in terms of their what they do, medical devices. Um, and this is reflective of the very, very strong medical device industry we have in the Twin Cities. And uh, often uh, a lot of our undergraduates are from the Twin Cities or surrounding areas and end up wanting to stay here. And this is a natural fit for them to work in these companies. But of course, we also have some local companies like 3M, Polaris, and uh, Honeywell are big employers of our, of our um, uh, graduates. And they're in other areas, as you can see. Um, and the, down the line, there are also people who are uh, companies that are in the local area, our big employers of our graduates. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay, 
So we have impact areas within the department that we've set up and these, these are listed on the left. And this is sort of mirroring what we have on our website. If you go to our website and you can find out what our impact areas and what specific technical areas there are within mechanical engineering. So these um, include energy transition and environment and sustainability, human health, next gen manufacturing, robotics and mobility. Um, I have some uh, slides on the right technical areas that line up with those impact areas. Um, and I'm gonna go through each of those in turn and describe a little bit about which classes you can take in those areas and how you can um, learn more about those specific areas of mechanical engineering. So let's get into that. So yeah, okay, so I'm gonna have, I have about a, one slide on each of these, uh, these areas or technical areas within mechanical engineering. And I start with biosystems and bioengineering because um, we uh, do a lot of research in this area. And as, as you have seen in the previous slides, we have a lot of our graduates go on to do medical device and um, in industry. So obviously it's a big focus of ours um, and we have research going on in the department uh, that goes from medical devices, medical robotics, um, really interesting work with neuro device engineering, uh, neural device engineering, um, cryobiology and bio heat transfer. And there's a very large center that's just happened on the, on the cryobiology front. Um, and uh, as you can see, um, Professor McAlpine, who sometimes gives a talk at this thing, but um, we have other people here who are doing exciting research as well, can give a talk, um, interested in uh, doing things like, um, you know, 3D printing of parts, uh, body parts and other uh, biological pieces. So it's really a very, very interesting uh, topic and uh, the mechanical engineers can get involved in. One thing I just wanna note is that we do have a biomedical engineering department in the College of Science and Engineering. And people often ask me, why would I wanna go um, into, if I wanna do this type of work, why would I get an ME degree versus a biomedical engineering degree? And the answer I usually give them is that we offer a much broader range of engineering experience. The, the heat transfer and, um, and design and other, other classes that we offer um, are applicable to biomedical problems and give you a broad range of um, uh, experience and skills that you can apply to these, these areas. So, and hopefully our undergrads will, and our panel will be able to um, elucidate that a little bit further. So, okay, next, next slide, please. Um, here's an area that's uh, near and dear to my heart. It's an area that I'm working in currently uh, and have done um, in, my, in my research career and combustions and engines. Uh, the figure on the upper right is from my laboratory. That's the Thomas E. Murphy Engine Research Laboratory. That's off of Como Avenue. I do hire undergraduates into my laboratory, even starting at the uh, freshman uh, to do research in my laboratory, as do many other faculty in our department if you approach them. Um, it's, it's often very advantageous to bring on um, uh, undergraduates into the research area uh, for in internships or other experiences, even very early on in your undergraduate career. Um, things in a combustion engines include cleaning and efficient combustion, advanced propulsion control, uh, plasma assisted combustion and high speed mixing and combustion. We also do uh, laser diagnostics and other things of combustion um, applications. And here's some examples of classes that we offer. We have an introduction to combustion course, um, internal combustion engines and gas turbines. These are all what we call technical electives that you can take uh, when you're a uh, junior and senior. Okay, next. Okay, the next area uh, that I'm gonna talk about is fluid mechanics. Professor Shen is here to give us a little bit more detail on this. So when he gives his talk, but uh, really we have a very strong, um, competency in fluid mechanics in our department. And this essentially is the, is, it means the uh, understanding the uh, fluid flow and, and, and fluids including gases and liquids. Um, SAFL is, uh, the, is the San Anthony Falls Laboratory that Professor Shen is directing. And that uh, has a huge facility for studying uh, fluid flow, including um, Extra, large scale flows uh, like the Mississippi River, for example, internal flows and engineering systems, turbulent and viscous flows, we do a lot of work with wind turbines and other things like that, which he can explain to you. And we have some really fantastic classes in, in fluid mechanics um, that students really enjoy taking, including our introduction and intermediate fluid mechanics courses. Okay, next. Uh, another area that we have that's somewhat unique in our department is what's called fluid power. And this is different than fluid mechanics in the sense that it 
mostly has to do with what you'll learn are incompressible fluids or fluids that, um, that, that, that like liquids uh, that are used to transfer power. And in this case, uh, hydraulic actuation, fluid power from machinery, um, and robotic actuation and other things like that are, are areas of research in our department. And there's a senior laboratory called Fluid Power Lab, a control laboratory that you can take uh, to learn more about this topic and, um, and, and get involved with this area. Okay, next. Uh, materials and mechanics is an area that's, uh, that is also very um, big in our department. We are developing um, materials for manufacturing, functional materials, um, and, and out of additive manufacturing and 3D printing, uh, nanoscale materials and devices. And some examples of classes include our uh, fluid, uh, I have fluid mechanics here, which is the wrong one, <laughs> typo there. Um, and stress analysis, sensing, and transducers are a couple areas that we, uh, a couple classes that might be uh, useful in this area. Okay, next. Uh, particle technology is another competency of mechanical engineering at University of Minnesota, which, which is very unique to our department. Um, we have a number of, of professors who are uh, world renowned in the area of, of examining particles. And you can imagine this was pretty important during the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, where a lot of our researchers were doing work with um, um, aerosolized breath particles and other things and studying those and had made some interesting findings uh, early on in the 2020 timeframe and continuing on until now. Um, other things we're looking at are air pollution control, things like clean room design, filtration, nanofabrication. And um, you, know, you can get involved through a laboratory class or through some, some of our senior um, technical elective courses as well. Um, you can learn more about um, particulate and, and, and particle technology. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so plasmas are another real area of technical strength in our department. And what is a plasma, you may ask? Um, a, a plasma is essentially like a, a, a very, well, it can be high temperature or low temperature uh, ionic uh, flow, kind of like a, if you think about a spark plug, that's a plasma, or, a, a, or if you think about some of these low temperature plasmas that we're working on include things like um, uh, these, these discharges that you see here. Uh, that can be used for all sorts of things like producing novel materials or solar windows or photovoltaics, um, novel green chemical, um, chemical conversion processes, and even down to wound healing using plasmas to, to heal wounds um, uh, on the surface of your body. So really interesting stuff that's going on in this area as well. Next slide, please. Um, sensing and controls, this is a traditional area of mechanical engineering, and, uh, and in this area we have a lot of work going on um, in control of autonomous vehicles, hybrid control, robotics, and um, wearable health monitoring, other things like we're doing in research include a driving simulator and some collision protection things for bicycles even. Um, we have a system dynamics and control course that you can take or you must take as an ME student, but then other elective courses like motion control laboratory and feedback control systems are are areas that are classes that you can take in this area to become uh, more knowledgeable in the area of controls. Next slide, please. All right, only a couple of these left. So thermodynamics and heat transfer, um, also very important areas, traditional areas within mechanical engineering. Um, our areas include um, nano heat, um, nanoscale heat transfer, thermal management, electronics, um, efficient uh, uh, production of solar fuels from solar. So this is kind of an interesting area that we're, we've been working on in the research area of, this, of the department. Um, you can take classes and learn more about solar thermal en energy using the, or through the uh, ME5312 um, class, which is uh, about um, uh, solar thermal technologies and um, other classes, you know, that you can learn more about heat transfer, uh, we have a conduction course. We have other courses on um, thermal uh, environmental engineering, which is more like um, HVAC and, and learning more about um, indoor environmental uh, conditioning and that, and, that, and that kind of thing. So this is another big area where mechanical engineers play a role. Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so th that kind of gives a, an idea of the, of the and technical areas within ME. Now, um, talking a little bit about what you can do as an ME student, there are a lot of opportunities within ME. Once, you know, besides taking classes and 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 and, um, and 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 learning about these different areas, you can join student groups. 
we have a number of really active student groups in our department. Um, we have American Society of Mechanical Engineers, which I mentioned earlier, Formula SAE, which is to build a race car. Um, Minnesota Electric Racing is pretty similar. They're building an electric race car, which is really exciting. Um, and She Is Me uh, is a, uh, or She Is ME, it's a, a play in words, is a, is a really excellent group that is uh, supporting um, engineers and women engineers, uh, but anybody can join essentially. I think um, we'll hear more about that. Um, perform research, as I mentioned, uh, faculty are very uh, excited to um, take undergraduates on into the research labs and, um, and you can do that through directed research. Um, undergraduate research opportunities program or UROP is something you could start very early on in your undergraduate career. Um, and some faculty just hire undergraduates. I know I hire undergraduates into my laboratory, just um, who, people who want to come and do work study or they want to have a job and learn more about our, our research. Um, you can also participate in our co-op program, which is now um, offered through the College of Science and Engineering. And that's a really exciting opportunity for you to be able to um, do practical training and get credit for it um, during your undergraduate um, program. And you can work at local companies or companies who are doing mechanical engineering um, around the country and, um, and uh, receive credit for, for doing that and get technical elective credit for that. Um, yeah, and you can also obtain, of course, um, mechanical hands-on skills through um, inner, you know, work in our laboratories or machine shop and our in the Anderson Labs, which I think is the next slide, right? Or next. Um, Miranda, next slide, please. Yeah. I was right. Okay, Anderson Student Labs. So you know, getting hands-on experience and really getting uh, involved in in um, in doing mechanical things is definitely uh, available for mechanical engineering students. Um, we have uh, Anderson Student Innovation Labs. We have um, uh, availability for undergrads for team projects, for class projects. Um, you know, in the, in the following list of, of things you can get involved with the 3D printers, laser cutters, hand tools, all sorts of things, um, really machining and learning how to do um, computer um, numerical um, machinery, uh, machining using uh, mills and lathes and all that kind of stuff you can learn how to do um, within our program. Okay, next. Okay. So I'm just on time, 5.20, so it's good. Um, I, now I'm, I'm going to introduce uh, one of our, well, one each of our faculty speakers. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about their research programs and um, we'll let Professor Lian Shen go first. His, his camera came on here. Um, and um, Professor Shen, would you like to share your slides? Yes. Okay, excellent. So I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, well, um, my name is Lian Shen. I am a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And my research area is fluid mechanics. So I wanted to use the next few minutes to have a quick introduction about that. So we are mechanical engineers. So basically we study mechanics and the uh, 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 subject of our study is in my group is fluid. So that means air, water, oil, okay, and all those things that flows, and including, for example, the blood okay, in our hum, uh, human bodies. And this subject is very important for a lot of things like uh, aerodynamics, how airplanes fly, okay, combustions, engine, how engine works, and it goes all the way to um, uh, weather, forecasting and oceanography and about our global environment. So as a professor Northrop just said, in mechanical engineering, we identify five major impact areas for us to make contributions to. And in each of those areas, then fluid mechanics plays a very important role. And in my research group, then our main research tool is computer simulations. And here uh, I gave some examples of our simulations. And on the lower right, you can see, we can simulate uh, waves at the lake surface, at ocean surface, very accurately. And also we can study uh, atmosphere and we can study things happening in the natural environment. 
and the things related to agriculture, like a canopy flows, okay? and also for underwater vehicles, and in addition to airplanes. Okay? And at the small scales, then we can look at sea sprays, aerosol particles, and also bubbles in the water. So the range of scales is very wide, okay? from very small scales to very large scales. So how do, how do we do that? We use computer simulations in my group. And here we use some of the largest supercomputers in the world. And among them, there's one very nice supercomputer that is at our university, that is in Minnesota Supercomputing Institute. And it has about 20,000 cores. What does that mean? Each core corresponds to like one of our desktop computer. So we somehow make 20,000 of such computers work together to tackle some of the very challenging problems. And then we also use some of the bigger computers nationwide to do these kind of simulations. So what kind of problems do we study? Well, we care a lot about our environment, climate change, and for example, for global warming, then what will be very important is greenhouse gases like CO2. How do they transfer from atmosphere to the ocean? That will play a very important role in the global carbon budget. And then of course, we wanted to study the heat transfer to related to the global temperature. And on the right, that is a problem uh, my research group studied in the past several years. And as you probably can recall, about 10 years ago, there was a big tragedy happened in Gabo, Mexico or spills with the deep, deep water horizon. Okay. Then okay, to study how those spilled oil transport, how can we effectively remove them? Then we need to study the fluid motions associated with the oil, that is one fluid, and in water, that is another form of fluid, and on the action of the wind, air, that is a third type of fluid. So therefore, we need to understand the fluid mechanics for this problem. Then, Another major area of research is renewable energy. Wind energy, for example, that is one of the major renewable energy source. And the people have studied extensively the, wind and, uh, the energy in land, on then uh, the energy offshore, okay, overseas, that will be the next frontier. And offshore wind energy also includes potentially wind energy over Great Lakes. Okay. So how do we do that? That is a very interesting engineering problem. And on the right, I showed a few examples about the wave energy. We can also harvest the wave energy from Great Lakes, from oceans. And then okay, also we look at uh, uh, fish. Okay? And although we are not a biologist, actually as mechanical engineers, we realize they are much better engineers than human beings. They can swim at efficiency much, much higher than any machines we can design nowadays. Okay? So therefore we want to study how they interact with the fluid flows, that is the water flows around them and how we can learn that to better improve our uh, uh, design of underwater vehicles. Okay? And we, as I mentioned, my group uses computer simulations to do that. Okay? And nowadays machine learning is, has become a very powerful research tool. So on the left, I give one example that is the simulation of wind farms. And you can see actually we have arrays of those wind turbines. And to simulate about 10 minutes of operation of a wind turbine, here on supercomputers, we need two days, 48 hours to simulate that. But using the data, then using machine learning, then it can take, we can reduce the simulation times to 30 seconds. So that will be big save of time. And with the increase of computer power, okay, now okay, we are also looking at the far front of computer simulations. For example, quantum computing. Can we increase this speed exponentially? And that is one of the research questions we are considering. And although we are doing computer simulations mainly, also we collaborate very closely with the experimentalists. And they do experiment in the field. And on the left, that is the wind turbine owned by University of Minnesota. 
And also we go to the field to use airplanes, we use ships and to do all kinds of measurements. And then my last slides just to show, you know, what kind of experiments we are looking at in the coming years. We are looking at Kennedy Space Center okay, in Florida because it has the longest uh, runway for space shuttles. And we are going to the desert. We are going to Monterey Bay, very beautiful area to do a measurement to study the fluid flows there. Okay. And Hawaii will be the next site and the Yellow Sea okay, and Alaska. Okay, that will be uh, what we aim to study in 2025. So with that, I'm going to stop my presentation here. And then okay, the next uh, faculty member to present is uh, Professor Natasha Wright. All right, thank you, Professor Shen. That was excellent. Um, and I uh, really appreciate your presentation. Um, Professor Wright, are you ready to share your slides? Excellent. Okay. When you're ready, take it away. You're muted right now. There we go. You'd think we'd have that down by now in Zoom time, right? So uh, hi, everyone. Natasha Wright. I'm a new professor here in mechanical engineering. And today I'm going to talk to you about two areas of my research, desalination, which is a form of water treatment and kidney disease, and how are these related? And the fun part about mechanical engineering is that you learn the tools to that can be applied to a bunch of different types of problems that may seem pretty disparate at the beginning. And we learn how to design systems using those tools. And my research group specifically focuses on how to design systems that use fluids, like you just talked, um, heard Liam Shen talk about, but specifically in what I call resource constrained contexts. That means I look specifically in contexts where we have socially disadvantaged or marginalized communities. These are often low in low income countries, but not always. And because of my work focuses in low income countries, um, some of them are shown in the map there on the bottom right. I often, my work is often related to what we call international development and why we look at these problems in international development. You know, why is this something new? Don't we know the answers to all these problems? Well, we actually don't. Um, these are 17 sustainable development goals that the United Nations put together related to global, and all of these things are global challenges, things that we don't have solutions to. And I'm particularly interested in them because as a designer, there's really unique stakeholder dynamics, things like uh, policies, economic constraints, um, environmental constraints, local nonprofits that are at play that as a result, affect how I design my technology. And because of those constraints, there needs to be big scientific change or scientific investigation in order to meet the needs of the community. And so there's opportunity for scientific impact as well as social impact. And so the first project I'm gonna to talk to you about is related to clean water. And so while most drinking water systems we think about might be looking to remove bacteria, bacteriological contaminants, most of um, there's actually a, a large portion of the world that's at risk for chemical contamination. So in this map, we have over a billion people at risk for things like arsenic, fluoride, lead. I've heard about lead a lot in the U.S. over the last few years. Um, and all of these are, are at unsafe safe levels of chemical contamination if they're going to be used for drinking water. So for many, many years, my lab uh, and my research focused on desalination. And in some of my previous work, I worked on field piloting these technologies in places like rural New Mexico, India, Gaza. And because we implemented them with communities, we had a lot of insight on operation maintenance and performance issues. And one of those things that we learned is that we needed to expand what we considered our desalination system. So for example, while the you know, part doing the actual water treatment was in this trailer in this system, the system also contains the part that's powering that system, right? So in this case, most of my systems are uh, powered by solar power. These are photovoltaic panels here. But additionally, we need to consider where the water is coming from and where the water is gonna go. And so all of these chemical contamination treatment systems are going to take out those chemicals and then condense them into what something we called the brine stream, which is essentially a water stream that's now enriched with all of those chemicals we removed from the drinking water. And that's called the brine. And so that brine, we need to think about where that goes as well. Okay. And so we start to expand our, the system that we need to optimize. And with current technology, that brine treatment, treating that contaminant enriched waste actually takes 20 times more energy than the original desalination process, the original water treatment process. 
One system that does that looks like this. It's in Chandler, Arizona. But if we take a system like this and we think, how could we maybe make this cheaper? How could we get rid of this waste in a different way? Well, one idea you might have is that we could use an evaporation pond. You know, if we put all of this wastewater out in a big pond, eventually all the water will evaporate and we'll have solids that we can get rid of. But the problem is that evaporation ponds take a lot of area, land area, right? So we don't just need one football field size of evaporation pond. We actually need a hundred football fields of pond area in order to do the same thing as one of those plants. So one thing that my research group works on is to ask how can we reduce the land area required for a simple process like evaporation in order to treat this wastewater more cost effectively and in a more environmentally friendly way. To do that, we might think about what affects evaporation. For example, if I have more land area, I'm going to evaporate faster. Uh, if I have more airspeed, if my wind is moving faster, I'm going to evaporate faster. If it's hotter outside or it's lower humidity, I'm also going to evaporate faster. So what happens if I take all of that math and equations <laughs> and physics that I learn about how these systems work and use it to design something better? And so in my lab, we look at what's called a convection enhanced evaporation system, where we increase evaporation area using either vertical, horizontal, or all sorts of different arrangements of uh, fluid surfaces. We then increase the wind speed artificially by using effectively what's a fan um, to um, introduce these higher wind speeds during time of low wind or high humidity. And we also control uh, incoming brine temperature using concentrated solar, okay? So that's a water project, but I also work on health, okay? And just briefly, I'll touch on this because I think it's important to see how some of these concepts relate. So for example, end-stage renal disease, 88% mortality rate within three months in sub-Saharan Africa. End-stage renal disease is when your kidneys, what's shown on this slide, no longer function and long-term what's called dialysis, which is the treatment, is the only way that you can survive until you can get a kidney transplant. And so currently in most of the countries and contexts that we work in, hemodialysis is the only treatment option. And it requires the patient to come in three times per week. Right. And this is a problem, not only because the treatment costs a lot of money, but because it takes time to do that. And you're connected in this chair for three times a week for about four hours per time. OK, so my lab uses a process called design ethnography to actually quantify the technical re requirements and validate validate design potential. So what does that mean? In last year, we conducted 35 interviews in Nigeria, patients, stakeholders, doctors, um, government, federal regulators, et cetera. And one of the biggest things we kept hearing from these was that it takes a lot of time, right? It's not just the cost of treatment, it's the fact that a patient has to come to the center, which sometimes takes between 15 minutes, but sometimes it takes 10 hours, right? And so that costs money too. And so as a result, if there's a treatment modality that doesn't require us to travel, that could be a good thing. Well, it turns out that there is a treatment modality called peritoneal dialysis. In this treatment, the patient can stay at home and fluid is actually uh, put into the patient's abdomen or their peritoneal cavity, and the treatment occurs naturally over the, the human membrane, right, the peritoneal membrane. But the problem with this is that just like how there was a high cost associated with transport for hemodialysis, there's a high cost associated with peritoneal dialysis. And in this case, we learned that it was actually the cost of these fluid bags. But the benefit is that, or the benefit of my research group thinking about this problem is that the primary constituent of that fluid bag is water, right? And I know, and my group knows how to treat water in remote and rural contexts. And so what we do is we're thinking about, well, what would it take to generate, recycle this fluid in decentralized facilities all over the world, including in people's homes, or maybe even on a patient's belt, creating effectively an artificial kidney to enable peritoneal dialysis wherever a patient is. So I just leave you with this slide that we look at these problems in international development, not because they're easy and they're already solved in the US, but because they have their real global challenges that have really unique dynamics that actually push science further. And as a result, we look for both uh, scientific impact as well as social impact um, in my lab's work and in our department's work. And we're all really excited for you to join us and hope that you'll come work in our labs. Fantastic. All right. Good, good timing. Good presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Wright, for that presentation. Um, so I hope that you guys, uh, all of you um, participating, and there's a lot of you, 
um, you know, get a good sense of the sort of breadth of what mechanical engineers can do and um, how you can get involved. So next, I'd like to turn it over to um, Miranda and uh, to run our student panel. Um, so Miranda, are you ready to, to yeah. moderate the, the, the panel? Okay, excellent. Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. So yeah, so take it away. I mean, I think people can ask questions about anything, right? To any of our, uh, on any of the, the um, uh, the topics we discussed. And, and so we can all stay on and sort of uh, answer questions as needed. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Professor Northrup. And thank you, Professor Shen and Wright. Uh, it's really interesting to hear about all the research uh, happening in our department. And certainly that's just a, a small glimpse of the, the research going on in ME. Um, so I would just encourage all of you to um, look at our faculty bios up on our website and learn more about uh, all the different types of research uh, happening in our department. Um, and then I have received a lot of questions in the Q&A about if these slides in the presentation will be available. And the answer to that is a yes. Um, so what happens after this is CSC IT folks will go in and edit it. Um, do some minor edits, clean it up a little bit, um, clean up the captioning, and then um, they will be made available to the students. And you'll get an email either from CSE Student Services or from your CSE 1001 instructor when the video is available. All right, so. Let's see. Oh, here we go. All right, so as I had mentioned earlier, we have four current student panelists. David, Nicholas, Venkat, and Maddie, who are all current ME students in our department. And so uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because you will get to see not just a picture of them, but you'll get to see their actual faces um, during the panel. Uh, please use the Q&A to ask questions and I will uh, be happy to field those to our panelists. Um, but I think what I'll have the panelists do is introduce themselves and then um, state what year you are in school and maybe some of the things that you've been involved in uh, and why you chose mechanical engineer, engineering. So I will uh, pass it off to you, Maddie. Hi everyone, this is a really exciting time to talk about mechanical engineering. I'm currently a senior and also a first year master's student in the five year bachelor master's in mechanical engineering, which is also a really great program. Uh, some of the things I've been involved with in my time here, I am involved in research uh, in that cryopreservation space, as we've talked about a little bit, uh, did a year up with that. I've taken advantage of the career fair and internships, and I'm also one of the co-presidents of She is Mechanical Engineering, which is a group for women, and it's a super fun group, so I'll make sure to drop our website and our email in the chat at some point, uh, and I can hand it off to Venkat. Yeah, hey everyone. Um, I'm also a senior in mechanical engineering. I'm actually in the mechanical engineering building right now, hence the mask and gamer headset. Um, <clears throat> some fun things I've been involved with. I've been all four years so far, I've been involved with the fun student group, uh, mechanical engineering based in group. You now I was on the clean stone wheel team, Minnesota Electric Racing, and now most recently I'm the president of Gopher Motorsports, uh, the UMN's Formula SA team. We build race cars. It's super exciting, super fun. I will also shamelessly plug our team and drop a link to the website below. But um, outside of you know my student group involvement, I've had a couple internships uh, in the mechanical engineering field, um, most recently with Polaris, and that was also a blast. So I'll pass it on to David here. Hi, I'm David Jackshaw. I'm also a senior in mechanical engineering. Um, I was on the clean snowmobile, clean snowmobile team with Venkat for a few years, and I'm the treasurer of the ASB group. Um, Nick is actually the president of that group, so I think he'll probably send the, the link to that group as well in the chat just to get people involved. Um, I've also done a few internships. One of them was with Venkat down in Augusta, Georgia, working on vehicles. And then most recently, this past summer, I worked up at Arctic Cat, uh, working on the powertrain team, developing new snowmobile systems. So I'll pass it off to Nick. Yeah, so David already kind of introduced me a little bit. I am Nicholas. I am a senior as well in mechanical engineering, and I am a co-president of ASME. So I'll drop the 
email and uh, website in the chat as well. Um, I've also had a few experiences previously with General Mills and um, I will be working for General Mills after. And yeah, so I look forward to answering your guys' questions. Thank you. So our first question from the audience is what inspired all of you to choose ME? I can start. I actually started as a biomedical engineering student. So I think this is always a good um, little story to tell for those in a similar boat. Um, and some good advice that I was given recently is what do you want your resume to look like in five years? So what are you most interested in? What kind of skills do you want to be able to leverage? Uh, but back in that time, I was interested in physics and math, pretty as many of you, I guess, in CSC probably are. But when I came here, I realized that biology and chemistry weren't really my passions, although I care about helping people. And I found, and this presentation was a really good example of that, but mechanical engineering has a lot of impact areas that are near and dear to my heart and many people and very relevant to the world today. So I found that mechanical engineering was giving me the skills and the background for things that I was interested in. And so I decided to go with mechanical. I can move it to Venkat. Yeah, I guess uh, pretty simply, I really like cars. <laughs> um, I've always loved cars ever since I was a young kid. And um, um, like Maddie, I was pretty good at math and science in high school and stuff. So I felt like mechanical engineering would be a pretty good fit uh, even before I entered college. So I always kind of had my eyes set on that. And, um, you know, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. So it's been great so far. Um, I'll pass it on to David. Yeah, so for me, very similar to Maddie, I started out between biomedical engineering and mechanical engineering. But as uh, Professor Northrop noted earlier in the slides, there's lots of opportunities in the medical device industry as mechanical engineers, and it definitely opens you up to to more opportunities. I would say, um, just with the broader range of classes, and you you get a little bit more of more of things rather than focusing right away. So for me, I probably not going to be going to biomedical or me medical devices. Um, I actually have also accepted a job, just like uh, I know Maddie and Nick have, um, working on vehicles and so so similar to Venkat with those interests, but uh, just growing up loving building things and science and math, that's that's what led me led me to mechanical engineering. Yeah, pretty similar to the other people as well. Um, I honestly had no idea if I even wanted to be an engineer, let alone a mechanical engineer. Um, I was just kind of good at math and science, honestly. So I'm like, all right, let's go into engineering. Um, and then as Professor Northrup mentioned, um, mechanical engineering honestly has probably the most like variety you can pick out of engineering. So I didn't have much choice and I'm like mechanical engineering gives me the best option to kind of like pick and choose as I go along this journey. So um, it's, and then later in junior and senior year, you can kind of pick classes into the specific field you want to go to, so. Thank you. Next question is about your internships uh, and what sorts of responsibilities and um, things did you do at your internships? Yes, we can keep this rotation rolling. Um, I initially started with a few internships in the civil engineering field, uh, kind of with COVID-19. Unfortunately, I had a Boston Scientific internship canceled and had to pivot really quickly. Um, but those internships involved a lot of moving around and looking at manufacturing systems and looking at quality and improving things like that. And then I also worked at General Mills this past summer and that looked like project management. It looked like working with a lot of people and operations. If you really enjoy people, there's a place for you in engineering. Uh, if you don't, there's also a place there. But my interests now are kind of leaning towards controls and robotics. So that's why I'm returning to um, General Mills, but working in the control side. So automating the machines that create food. Yeah, so uh, as David mentioned, the two internship experiences I've had, um, this past summer was Polaris, and then the summer before that was with Textron Specialized Vehicles. I think my, and in both of those roles, I was kind of doing design work as a design engineer um, for mechanical engineering. And I think my biggest takeaways from those two experiences were you kind of have to learn, um, you know, when do you, you know, ask for help versus when do you really 
figure something out on your own. You know, everyone's really busy, a lot of moving parts in a company. So you have to really focus on um, knowing, you know, how can I get the job done ahead of me? And, but how do I also accomplish it? I was spinning my wheels for too long and, you know, not knowing where I'm going. So basically just wanted to reach out and uh, how to deal with ambiguity in the workplace. Yeah, so going off what Venkat said there, both the internships I've had, I've been on teams that have been uh, super helpful. Any questions I have, they welcomed uh, questions and were sure to point me in the right direction. I think it really helped me grow a lot as an engineer. My first internship after sophomore year was at Textron Specialized Vehicles down in Augusta, Georgia. I worked on uh, intake and exhaust systems and vibration analysis. So that was something I really hadn't done before, but it was very interesting to me. And then this past summer, I worked up at Articat in Thief River Falls. I was on their powertrain team, so working on engine design and uh, some FEA analysis on that. And you really apply what you learn in class in, in that kind of role as a design engineer and doing analysis, where you have to apply the different kinds of stresses and torques. So I think that the mechanical engineering program uh, here really, really did a good job preparing me for that. And I'll also say that uh, with the ASME club that, I was, that I'm a part of and now an officer for, um, they hold a lot of great resume review sessions, um, company panels that'll come in and, and talk to you about interviewing. Uh, those things really help me when going to the career fair and talking to companies about, about possible internships. Yeah, so for my internship after sophomore year, I worked for Siemens Infrastructure, um, kind of designing fire alarm systems. So it was a lot of design work. And then after junior year, I interned for General Mills in a manufacturing and engineering associate role. Um, so I really got to see kind of both the design and manufacturing, because obviously, as I said, I really had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, so I think, especially for all you guys, it's as you get into internships, like don't set your mind on one thing, kind of internships are a way to learn and kind of figure out what you want to do. Um, so I figured out, I honestly wasn't interested in design really much. I'm more interested in the manufacturing roles. Um, so that was one way I like figured out kind of and limited where I wanted to go with kind of my life choices and career, I guess. So. Yeah. Yeah. And we had a, just a couple of follow up questions going off of internships when the best time to get involved in internships and any advice for getting an internship. Um, so it's pretty rare for um, for freshmen to get an internship after their first year, but it's not um, impossible. So um, I would encourage you to start looking early, attend that career fair, even if you're not actively searching for an internship. Um, most often students are getting internships after their sophomore year and or junior year uh, is usually when they're getting internships. So anything that you can do now to build up that resume, um, you know, getting involved in research, joining a student group, taking on some leadership um, activities, things like that will certainly help in, in landing that internship. And also, of course, use the CSE Career Center. They are well equipped um, to help you uh, in your internship and, and job search as well. And then I know we had a, a couple of questions about research that uh, Professor Northrup was going to, to answer. Oh, yeah, I don't want to take too much time away from the panel questions because there are a lot, but I just want to answer just in terms of faculty research, um, the best ways to meet um, faculty to do research. We don't have currently any like big expos or anything like that, but um, it's a good idea. Um, but one way is really to just connect with faculty and go to our web pages. We all have web pages, and if you're interested in a certain area, just go to them and connect with faculty directly through even writing emails um, is a really good way uh, to just connect with people. Also, if you start taking ME courses and you connect uh, with a professor you really like in your class, it's also a good way to get um, connected with um, research opportunities. But um, I, I would say when when freshmen and sophomores write me emails. Um, and expressing interest specifically in, in my research, I pay attention and I answer those emails and try to find opportunities for them. So, um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Um, Randy, do you want me to answer the question about chemi thermo? You said. Sure. Yeah, you can answer the one about yeah chemi and thermo. Um, what is the question? I can't see it. Oh. Uh, does the terms of studying the camps is different from chemical engineering? Yes. Uh, it looks like Professor Wright is typing a, an answer to that one, but I, I, I can answer it also that um, mechanical engineers 
uh, study heat, uh, heat transfer more exclusively and the heat transfer that you study in chemical engineering includes also what's called mass transfer. So that's kind of a, a, a difference. Also in chemical engineering, there's a lot more focus obviously in chemical reactions, whereas in thermodynamics and mechanical engineering, it is uh, more focused on what we call classical thermodynamics, which is um, looking at heat and energy uh, flows. So I'd say they're not the same, they're the same science, but not the same class. <laughs> so that's, that's, my, that's my answer. Okay. All right. So Continue. we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about classes. So two questions on that. One, what has been the most difficult class that you've taken in ME? And two, how do you balance a, a heavy course load or how do you balance uh, your course load with maybe extracurriculars and, and other things that you have going on? Most challenging course, I'd say that depends on your definition. Um, the course that I found the most strenuous was probably our measurements lab. It's called mechanical measurements lab because uh, it's kind of a continuous inflow of assignments and it's kind of like exactly what you're talking about, handling a lot um, at one time. So that's why that class was the most challenging for me. But there are some that are probably more like mind bending, which would maybe be kind of the thermo fluids heat transfer track. Um, how do you handle it? I would say constantly reprioritizing your time, finding a schedule that works for you, using your Google Calendar, your planner, those are kind of standard things. Um, and I would also say keeping a broad, oh, like think about things holistically, don't get caught up in each individual test or each point that you lose uh, and think holistically about how you're understanding the material and working it with your professors to do well in your classes. Uh, worst class, I'd have to say ME 2011. Um, uh, that one is the one where you build a robot. And honestly, it's super cool class. The only thing is, is that um, depending on your skill set coming into the class, you know, if you if you have programming knowledge ahead of time, manufacturing knowledge, uh, laser cutting knowledge, anything like that, um, it'll you can really leverage that to build a better robot and stuff. I unfortunately did not. So I had to learn a lot of that on the fly and um, pick it up as I went along. So that's what made it really challenging for me. But um, I think it's still a super cool class, even if it was challenging for me, um, especially at the very end, there's a big robot show where, uh, you know, if you've been spending late nights at Anderson Labs and kind of get to know your peers and then seeing their finished robots at the show and people come up with some really cool stuff. Um, and it's really cool to see the process beginning to end. So uh, while it is, you know, while it was hard and tough and challenging, it was definitely very rewarding at the end. And uh, kind of following up on what Maddie said, I think, you know, Google Calendar is a great resource to manage your time. I personally like to write things out by hand. So I have a physical planner I write in pen. I'd say um, an important thing is to keep yourself healthy and sane. So, you know, schedule time to hit the gym, talk with your friends, hang out and uh, stay flexible with your schedule. You know, if something comes up, you know, just move some things around. Um, you know, sometimes uh, sometimes it'll seem really overwhelming and I totally get the feeling. But the biggest thing is just to take it one thing at a time. Yeah, I'm gonna have to agree with Maddie that uh, basic measurements lab was probably the most difficult. Um, just with the with the scope of what you're doing, it is a really cool class. You get to kind of dip your hand in a lot of different types of engineering, I would say. Um, you do a lot of electrical engineering with that, a lot of wiring, but then you also do some stress analysis and things like that. So while it is kind of a tricky course with how much work it is and how many assignments there are, it is pretty interesting and you get to you get to learn a lot about engineering with it. And then just as far as managing your time, just just make sure you set aside time for to, to have some fun. Um, I'm a huge sports fan, so just going to games on the weekends, that's kind of my getaway from engineering. So like Saturdays, I'll go to all the football games or watch the football games. And it gives me something else to focus on rather than classes. So then back so then Sunday I can just go fully into course coursework and I'm not I'm not stressed out because I had a really fun day the day before. Um, just, just things like that. And then making sure you keep track of your assignments. So you don't get too overwhelmed. Um, I'm actually going to go a different route. Um, I'm going to go thermo and fluid mechanics were my toughest courses. Um, even though prof professor Northrup was my uh, professor for that. Um, it's just not my cup of tea really, um, doesn't really click with me. Um, I guess 
not my favorite courses. So that's why as I'm going into my tech electives, I'm choosing different courses. But um, you'll that's what the great thing about mechanical engineering is you get to kind of see what you want um, in life and your career. And then you get to kind of choose where to go from there. Um, but one thing I would um, recommend with dealing with hard classes and just like the hard class load is it's basically I everything's going to be hard in mechanical engineering, or not everything, but it's basically just time management. You got to pick and choose what you want to spend time on and what you want to attack now versus in a few days. So like Maddie said, just kind of have a schedule um, and just kind of attack things as you can and don't let everything flood your brain at once. Take it one th thing at a time. So. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we had a couple questions about like admission into the major. Um, so you may have heard about this in your CSE 1001 class. Um, so admission into the major, you need to have a certain set of courses completed or in progress before you can apply. And that differs based on the major that you're going to apply to. Usually you're going to be applying to your major in the fall of your sophomore year. Um, and you need to have a, a certain tech GPA. And so that would include all of your technical courses, not your lib eds or anything like that. Um, a 3.2 or higher technical GPA guarantees you admission into any major in CSE and anything below that is based on space. Um, and so certainly some departments have more space than others. Um, but, you know, for the most part, the, the departments, um, you know, try and accept as many students as, as possible. And then um, the other question was about if a student uh, wanted to switch to, you know, from BME to mechanical engineering, how could they focus, um, you know, or have some sort of focus on BME? And so when you get into your senior year, you will have technical electives um, or specialization electives that you can take. And that's a, a time for you to kind of focus um, on a certain area within within ME. And then of course, you know, you don't have to do research with just ME faculty. You could certainly see what the biomedical engineering professors are doing and, um, you know, see if you can help out in their lab. I know that that was another question um, in our Q&A here is, you know, a student who's interested in doing research with computer science faculty or whatever, like that is definitely okay. Um, certainly we have engineers on all sorts of teams um, that, that need to um, collaborate to, to solve the world's problems. So um, let me check. There was another one about, um, oh, maybe it went away. Someone might have answered it already. Miranda, do you want to answer the question about how difficult it is to get into ME? Yeah, so I mean, it's, like I said, a 3.2 or higher technical GPA guarantees you admission in and anything below that is based on space. I mean, in the past, ME has had the space to accept students with a lower than 3.2 technical GPA. Um, you know, I think the trend in the last few years has been about a 2.5 technical GPA. Um, and so that varies based on the major. Of course, you know, some of the um, really popular majors, um, but maybe the departments aren't as big, have a, a higher GPA um, requirement as well. So um, let's see, um, APAS says I'm in lower division. So that means you're pre-major. So once you apply to the major and get into the major, then you'll be, um, you'll have been accepted into the major. Pros and cons when pursuing ME. There are no cons. Sorry. No cons. Yep. <laughs> Next. Next question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we we think we tackled them um, for the most part. So I know there were a lot there, and we're out of time here. Um, but you know how to reach us all if you have questions. Um, I'm as you know the undergraduate program manager. Always happy to field any questions from prospective students. So you can always contact me at ME undergrad. And I can probably say the same thing for, for, for Professor Northrup as well as the Director of Undergraduate Studies. Um, if you have other questions about ME, we're certainly happy to answer them. And if you're interested in um, getting involved in the research with Professor Shen or Wright, uh, you can certainly contact them as well. 
thank you for joining us. Um, it was exciting to see um, the turnout here, and we hope that this was helpful as you choose which major is the best fit for you. Miranda, one maybe important question about when they can apply for the major and if they yeah. can apply yet this fall. Um, it depends if they have the uh, required set of courses needed for their major to apply. So usually that happens in the fall of their sophomore year um, because you need like statics and dynamics and multivariable calculus and, and whatnot. Um, you can contact your advisor directly and they'll be able to look into your situation, your coursework and see if you're eligible to apply. All right, thank you all to our panelists and our faculty presenters. We certainly appreciate the time um, that you have given us tonight for this event. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Okay, thanks.